Good. Take your Bibles to Jeremiah 29. We'll be taking a break from Jeremiah during this summer uh, months, and so we'll we'll conclude our time in Jeremiah for the next few weeks, several weeks anyway, with this passage, which just kind of gives us a taste of what we're going to see after the summer is over and get to enjoy some of uh, the more encouraging aspects of Jeremiah's message to the to the uh, people that were involved in the captivity time of Israel. Now, many of you know that I have a great love for coffee. And uh, I think I told some of you, even when I went to the mission field, I knew Dominica did not have good coffee selection. It was rather expensive and whatnot. So I began calculations of how much coffee do I drink a day? How much coffee would I need for four years period of time so that I could pack it all in my crates to send it to Dominica. And I calculated it all out and I needed 40 pounds of coffee. And so I packed those 40 pounds of coffee in there. I did run out. I miscalculated the fact that there would be other people drinking my coffee with me. But nonetheless, um, I packed 40 pounds of, of coffee, and I got down to Dominica, and they thought I was going to open up a store. I, I, I explained to them. I showed them the formula. Here's how many cups a day I drink, and here's, how many, here's what that ends up being, and how many pounds of coffee I'm going to need, and, 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 and I'm going to be here. There was one problem. Um, my my um, work permit only went from year to year, so they didn't buy my story, so they, they were looking for uh, some way to get some money out of me as I'm moving in, so... They charged me a tax on it like I was setting up a store. So that, that began, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, it really didn't begin, but it just is an illustration of my love affair with, with coffee. I see Dr. kind of smiling back there because he has sort of put a damper on my life by suggesting that for health reasons, I move away from caffeinated coffee to decaf. And he was right. I, you know, when you drink 20 plus cups a day, it, you, you, you sort of don't sleep well at night once you get into those. Now, don't look at me like that's terrible. It's, it's the nectar of life. But anyway, then I moved to New England and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. They have these coffee places you can drive in and you can get whatever you want. But then I realized that there are a lot of people out there who like coffee. And, you know, I, I'm, I've got to be careful here, but, man, I, I love it when the school year goes away and summertime comes in because you can get into a Dunkin' Donuts over here in Derry a lot easier without all these Pinkerton students <laughs> getting away. And they're just wanting to go at the same time as I do. But... But then I discovered on my uh, Dunkin' Donuts app and my, and my Starbucks app, I discovered this order to go. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm a little suspicious of these kinds of things. And so I, I'm watching this. And then I keep I'm standing in line. And I'm watching these people just walk right past me, go up and grab their stuff and walk away. Now I'm trying to think, how do they know that that's theirs? And who would just say that if I like what I saw... I couldn't take it. I don't know. But all I know is there's, I'm standing in line, waiting, 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 and these people are just walking in, grabbing it. So I decided to explore this Order to Go app because I don't like sitting in lines, and I don't like waiting. I like to get in, get out. Well, I ordered to go. I went to the one. We now live on this side of the circle, so I went to the one at Hampstead, Janet, that was, I know we fought about having that store there, but that's a lovely store. I'm so thankful that the Dunkin' Donuts is there. So, but they also have a line. So I decided to try this order to go thing. So I go on and I figure it all out. It takes me a couple times and I figure it out and I place my order and they say, are you ready for us to start it? I'm, yes, right now, because I want to get there. So I get there. And there's a line of people, and there's a, there's a drive throughs all backed up. And I'm like, <laughs> walk right up and stand at the order to go thing and, and wait. <laughs> and, and, you know, after a couple of minutes, some lady, she says, are you here to pick up something to go? Yes. Your name? John. Oh, she's getting it. 
No, I thought you were getting it. Nobody was getting it. <laughs> so they quickly fill my uh, iced coffee and uh, black decaf, Dr. Cunniff, and um, they fill it up and I, I'm able to go. And, and, and all the time I could feel the tension. Why am I having to wait? Why I ordered to go? I told him to start it right away. What's going on? I got to get going. I got things to do. When I got outside, that drive through line had not moved all that much. I still got ahead of several people who were standing in line before me. And I got out of there relatively quick. So I'm thinking this thing might work. But I also thinking about what is this tension that I'm feeling about waiting? We don't like to wait. We, 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 we've grown accustomed to immediate service. Whatever other convenience we can get, or however much quicker we can get things, we like that. We're drawn to it. We don't like to wait. And that's the way it can be about life sometimes. But we're going to look at a passage this morning where God is going to say exactly that. You need to wait. And we don't like that. But there's some valuable lessons here for us to learn about what it means to trust God when life just doesn't make sense and God just simply says, wait. So let's pray and ask God's blessing in our time in His Word this morning. Our Father, we, we come to a passage of Scripture where Jeremiah's words, which have been very hard and heavy for so many chapters, begin to turn towards the encouragement. But there's a, a reality that must be faced as well. That God wants His people to understand that the good things He has in store, He wants them to wait for. And that's hard. When life doesn't make sense, waiting for you to do something is difficult. So God, we pray that you will engage our hearts in your word. You'll give us understanding of it. And then we'll have the courage to take it and apply. Because life oftentimes is confusing and difficult. And waiting can be excruciating. Help us to see your truth today, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we've uh, mentioned, if you're in Jeremiah 29 already, it's kind of ironic considering how much of uh, Jeremiah we've already looked at. 28 chapters so far, and that we come to chapter 29, and now we find or we begin to embark on from chapter 29 through 33, one of the most encouraging portions, if not the most encouraging portion of Jeremiah's book, his, his writings to the captives or the, those in that are still in Jerusalem. So in chapters 29 through 23, we'll look at 30 through 33 after our summer series, but just kind of a brief 30,000 foot overview. Just think about this and, 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 and think about what we're going to be seeing in the future. In chapters 29 through 33, we're going to learn that God is going to bring the captives back from Babylon, back to Jerusalem. We find that out in chapter 30, verse 3. We're also going to find out that he loves them with an everlasting love. That's chapter 31, verse 3. And that he will turn their mourning into gladness. 31, verse 13. And that he will make a new covenant with them. 31, 31. A very uh, famous passage and well known to us. But he's going to make a new covenant with them. And that he will give them singleness of heart and action. They'll, they'll, they'll be on the same page with him. And if not more important than all of that, he's going to cleanse them from all of their sins. It's an amazing assortment of encouraging words that's coming from Jeremiah that he's telling them, this is, listen, you, don't be down in the mouth. Don't be disheartened. God has some great things in store. That's quite a pick-me-up from the last 28 chapters that we've looked at where the moments of encouragement have been few and far between. But we're going to spend a lot of time over the, in, in, starting in the early fall, late summer, we're going to have to spend a lot of time seeing what great things God has in store. Chapter 29 begins that. 
chapter 9, 29 has that encouragement, but it provides a context for all that he's about to say. All these messages are in the context of the prophecy that Jeremiah gives concerning 70 years of captivity. 70 years. I want you to think about that. 70 years of captivity. All these good things as he's looking towards the future. Listen, I've got some things in store for you. But it's in the context of 70 years of captivity. So while these chapters have you know, messages of hope, there's also a strong dose of reality that must be processed by those taken into Babylon in captivity. Jeremiah's major ministry was to those that were left behind in Jerusalem. But chapter 29, he begins talking to the captives who've been taken to Babylon. And chapter 29 really is a couple of letters back and forth between Jeremiah and another prophet and, and whatnot. But nonetheless, the point of Jeremiah's message to these that are in captivity is that the dream of getting back home anytime soon is gone. Forget it. Now, there were false prophets, as we'll see in this passage, who were saying within two years, and once that was picked up by the mass media of Israel and Babylon, it was everybody saying the same thing. Two years, two years, everything's going to be back to normal. Don't worry. And Jeremiah is saying, no. That's gone. Forget that. Those are false. Those are not sent by God. It's going to be 70 years. There's a big difference between two years of endurance and 70. 70 is a long time to wait for all that God has in store. But there have been, the, the, the reality is their lives have been turned upside down. They've been taken captive. They've been moved away. Think about Daniel. Daniel. Younger than the ones that we saw, high school graduates here, being taken into captivity. And for 70 years ahead of him, his life is not going to be about home. His life is about being a captive in a foreign land. 70 years. Their lives have been turned upside down. And they're not sure how they're supposed to live. What are we supposed to do? If you remember as you read through the Daniel, one of the things Daniel struggled with is the king giving him food that was not appropriate for a, a, a person seeking to live for God and be faithful to the covenant that they made, God had made with them. And Daniel struggled with this because the king's food, although it was good, wasn't meeting the standards that Daniel had. So you had all these tensions. How do I live in a foreign land which, which doesn't appreciate my values? How do I do that? How do I live in a place which not only doesn't value my values, but actually runs counter to them? Those are the questions that they're trying to figure out. Well, should we listen to those who are saying two years, or should we listen to Jeremiah 70? Because if it's 70 years, we've got to think differently than just two years. It's a big deal. Their lives have been turned upside down. And regardless of whether it's 2 or 70, they had to understand that life as they knew it was over for the foreseeable future. Now we all go through times and circumstances that simply do not make sense to us. And we don't know when we're going to get out of it. We seem to be in periods of time we're, we just, we're, we're not sure what's going on. We're not sure what God is up to. We're not sure how long this is going to last. And all we can think about is, get me out of this. And the hard thing is when God says, no, I want you to stay in it. We all go through those times when they don't make sense. And the problem is we can begin to feel distant or frustrated with God because of our own confusion. So as we approach this passage... What I want us to keep in mind is this. The circumstances of life can often make us feel abandoned or condemned by God. But God views them as means to His glorious purposes. That's such a hard concept to get a hold of. Because as soon as life begins to spin out of control and go in directions that we think is, is bad, or we think our life totally stinks, what in the world? This is a waste and we cry out to God, we can feel distant, we can feel condemned by Him. When reality is, is that God is doing something bigger than what we can imagine. And He's accomplishing His purposes in His time frame, not ours. That is really hard. So how...
God does not want God to be honored and glorified. They could care less about the values of the captives of Jerusalem. And so Jeremiah writes these words, and we, we have the opportunity to look at them. Now let's look at the big picture real quick, and then we'll kind of settle in on that portion where Jeremiah give, gives specific instructions. Now, what we see in verse 1 through 23, we see Jeremiah and, and how he writes a letter. And we have, this, we have the understanding of it all, and, and we see how there's a response to that. But what we see here is the particulars. As we look at the particulars of chapter 29, we can just feel and sense and understand God, the confusion that people have about what God is doing, His actions. And so in, in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 29, we, we have the setting, who's addressed, the date of writing, the delivery of the letter. Those particulars are given to us in verses 1 through 3. 4 through 23, we have the content of Jeremiah's letter. And what he provides for them is a plan of action for those that have been taken in captivity, verse 4 through 14. Then there's a warning that is given against the false teachers and false prophets, which we've seen numerous times in the first 28 chapters. And that takes you from 15 to 23. And what Jeremiah is going to do is he's first going to condemn these, these uh, false teachers, these false prophets, and then he's going to provide some clarification on, on what they need to do. And then verse 24 through 32, you basically have the false prop, prophets, the religious leaders of, in Babylon, are, are just annoyed as those back in Jerusalem with Jeremiah. They are annoyed, and so they write this letter back, and, and you have all this stuff going on. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, we, we're, we're going to see what God is doing. Now look at verses 1 through 3 real quickly, and it says, These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exile and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So he's telling who's being addressed there. Then we see the date of writing. And this was after King jo Jochen, jo Jeconiah, and the queen mother, and the eunuchs, and the officers of Judah, and Jerusalem, and the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. Basically, he had drained Jerusalem of all of its leadership and skilled workers. And so this is the date of the writing. It's right after this. This captivity was taken. And so Jeremiah is given the task of writing them and giving them specific instructions on how they are to live. Then verse 3 tells us about the delivery of the letter. And it says this. It says, The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan and Gemera, and the son of Hilkah, and whom Zedekiah, the king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And it said. So we have all the setting that is given there. Then the content is provided for us. And, and the majority of that content is found in, in verses that we'll look at in just a moment. But when you, when you look at it, you, you're going to see that, that basically God is going to tell them they're going to have to wait. They're going to have to recognize that the time is not for them to, to rush into listening to these prophets or rush into making plans and preparations. But it is the time to listen that God has done something and He has a time frame and your responsibility is to live within this confusion that God has given to you. Notice with me, if you will, verse 4 in particular where God sets it up and says, this is what's been done. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent. This is what God has done, not Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's the one who's come in. He's the one who's sacked Jerusalem. He's the one who's come in and, and, and taken all these captives. He's the one who's grabbed all the riches of Jerusalem and the temple. He's the one who's done all these things. But God clearly states from the foremost, foremost, forefront here, I'm the one who did this. I'm the one who sent you. You are there for my purposes. You are there because I put you there. And Jeremiah's message is, and you might as well get ready because you're going to be there for 70 years. But then as you get down to 
verse 5, he begins to provide for us these instructions that we're going to look at in just a moment. But listen to this, what he says, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. In other words, live your life. And so we have this, this, this instruction that's given, look, you're going to have to live life. If you're ready to take a wife or a husband, take one because you're going to be here for a while. And then have children. And guess what? Then you're going to give your children in marriage and they're going to move on in life. Because this is long term, 70 years. Okay, that's, that's a long, long time. And so he says, you basically need to sit down. And, and so as we, we see these multiple messages coming through, as we get to verse 24, it says this. To Shemaiah, uh, or, well, he, he actually says it before that, but to, here's what it says. To, to Shemaiah, uh, the, the Nehalim, you shall say, and he's, he refers to the letter, and he wants, to, he wants to clarify the points that he made and rebut them. And it says, Thus says the Lord God of the hosts of Israel, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah the son of Messiah, the, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priests instead of Jehoiada and the priest, to have charge in the house of the Lord over every madam who, madman who prophesies, to put him in the stocks and neck irons, now, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah? Why, why aren't you dealing with Jeremiah? Because Jeremiah keeps talking about 70 years. I'm telling you, God says two. Why haven't you dealt with him? You're in that position. Deal with him. And so you have all these multiple messages going on. Shemaiah is saying two years. Jeremiah is saying 70. And the people that are captives there are trying to figure out which message am I to listen to? Because what, whatever message I listen to is going to determine my plan of action. And Jeremiah says, don't listen to these guys. This is what you need to do. And in fact, that's what happened. Now here's what we have to keep in mind as we get ready to move into the specific instructions that God gives here. Is that when we allow the emotions of confusion or frustration to rule our hearts, we can miss the plan and the purposes of God. Yes, they were confused. Yes, they were frustrated. But they had to hone in on what God was saying and, and trust what God was saying. And so when we allow these emotions of confusion and frustration to rule our hearts, because we don't maybe like what God's saying, or we don't maybe understand all that God's saying, or maybe we just don't want to listen to what God is saying. We can't allow these frustrations and confusions to rule our hearts. We have to simply... Trust Him in the midst of it. Now here's the problem. Our desire to control life is so inbred at times. We often choose the quick man-made fixes and, and fantasies over patiently waiting on the Lord to accomplish His purposes. Now this is tough. Because we come up with all kinds of ways in which we can circumvent the waiting we find out all kinds of ways of figuring out how I can get things done my way or quicker or better in my mind. We don't like waiting. And so, as it is with our Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks, we try to do it with God. Where's the app to make it faster for God? Well, you know, maybe God's just not quite sure which path to take. I'll just help him out here. I'll suggest a few for him. Our desire to control life is so inbred in us that we do very often choose these quick man-made fixes. But waiting can be so hard. I got a little uh, picture here for you to see. Now, all the ladies in here don't take offense. But, uh, yeah, this is sort of the way it feels sometimes when you're waiting. I know it was for when my daughter was at home. She's become more like her mother, and now she takes better care. Right, Tiffany? Hope so. But anyway, the fact is, we can feel like as we're waiting that we're going to die here. Seven years is a long time to wait. Okay, enough of that. Let me give you a, positive, a negative and positive way of understanding waiting when it comes to the Bible. 
First of all, negatively speaking, waiting on the Lord is an undefined time period imposed on you. God says, I did this. So it's imposed on you when you experience the presence of something unwanted or the absence of something wanted. When I don't get what I want or when I have something that I don't want and I don't know when it's going to end, but it's this undisclosed period of time that God has imposed upon me. That's what it means to be waiting on the Lord. That's negatively uh, what we mean when we experience this. Because this is what we feel like. When is it going to end? I don't want this or I want something that I don't have. This is the way it feels to us. But what God wants us to understand, positively speaking, waiting on the Lord carries with it the anticipation of satisfaction. The presence of something unwanted will be removed. And the absence of something wanted will be satisfied. We, it, it's a matter of trusting that God is going to bring deliverance in His time and in His way. But He's going to do it. It's waiting for it. That's what waiting on the Lord. Leaning into His promises and away from our desires to fix it ourselves. To get out from underneath it. To make it stop. To make it quit. To get out of it. That's what this is all about. Waiting on the Lord means that I'm willing to lean into Him and trust that He is going to deliver, that He will bring an end. And that's what the people of Jerusalem needed to know. Jeremiah was telling them, look, it's going to feel like a long time. It's going to feel hard and it's going to feel difficult. But trust in God's promises. That's what he says from chapter 29 through 33. God's got something in store. God's got a big plan. But it's going to take some time for it to get there. You need to wait. And that can be hard. Now sometimes the, the hard part about it is God doesn't always tell us you've got to wait 70 years. If, I mean, the fact of the matter is we're going through a difficult time. If we knew there was an end coming in sight... We might be able to do it better than not. But when we don't know when it's going to come to an end, when we don't know how long it's going to take, it can be excruciating to try to work our way through this. So God doesn't always tell us, but at least they were given a 70 years. But I mean, think about it. 70 years. A whole life goes by in 70 years. So it's still hard to fathom. In other words, you're going to have to settle in for the long haul and just wait on what God is doing and trust Him in the midst of it. So that's why we want to go back and we want to look in particular at verses 4 through 14 when we see the principles that we can glean for our day and what to do when confused by God's actions. What is Jeremiah telling them? So let's read verse 4 down through verse 14. You just follow along as I read, and we're going to see what God tells them through the pen of Jeremiah. Here's what it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, let their, um, and, and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on, be, on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie. And they that are prophesying to you in my name, I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon, my, uh, on, upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me 
And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from, from which I sent you into exile. Now, many of us quote that verse, verse 11, and we quote it and we use it and we find comfort in it, and rightly so, but we forget the context in which it's in. So let's look at what God's really saying to these, these people in captivity when life is confusing, and let's draw some principles for ourselves. First of all, I think what God is trying to say to them through Jeremiah is that when life doesn't make sense and it seems like your whole world's been turned upside down and God's saying, wait, this is, where, this is what life is going to be like for the foreseeable future. First and foremost, verses 4 through 6, he tells them to be productive. He says we should never, un we're, we're learning that we should never underestimate the power of a godly family and lifestyle in the midst of a post-God God culture. We, we, we should never undervalue that. We should be productive. So, okay, we may feel like captives in our own land. We may feel like we've been left behind. We may feel like that uh, somehow our world's turned upside down and crazy and there's nobody to support us. What are we to do? What are we to do in this day and age? We are to be productive. We're to grow godly families, pass on godly traditions from moms and dads to children who will then pass them on to children and their children. We are to be productive. We are to be people who are living as lights and testimony in the place where God has put us. It doesn't matter whether it's favorable or not. It doesn't matter whether our country continues to turn towards disfavor of Christianity or not. What are we to do? We're to live as godly people and godly families. Never underestimate the power of a family that lives by the principles of this book and seeks to please God and live for Him. Never underestimate it. That's what he's saying. He's saying be productive. Build your homes, build your gardens, be productive. Never underestimate the power that our families have when we turn and seek the Lord. This is why it's so important for us to build godly, strong marriages and homes that, that love and, and cherish the Lord and that we are what we are on Sunday all throughout the week. This is why it's so important. To be productive. In other words, what God is saying is you live your life. You're a captive, yes. Live your life. Show forth the principles that I have given to you. Regardless of what culture you find yourself in, it matters not. Live for God. Live your life. Do all the things that people do. Produce, be productive, shine as a testimony to your God. Then verses 7 through 9. Verses 7 through 9, he, did not, he takes it a step further and he says, be a blessing. Now notice verse 7 and, and, and what he says this, he says, but seek the welfare. The word welfare, it's probably, it's probably a good translation, but the word welfare really is the same word shalom or peace. But it takes us well beyond just not living in conflict. But it means to be a blessing. Seek the welfare, the goodwill of the place in which you live. Now think about what God's telling them to do. You've been taken captive. You've been taken from your homeland and you've been placed in a culture that doesn't honor God and, and doesn't care about your faith or about you as a person. You're a slave. You're a, you're a person who is captive and what he says to him is be a blessing seek the welfare of the place where you are we are called to be to move beyond the posture of not causing trouble or conflict to being an active blessing to our post-god culture now most of our culture sees us as angry or somehow disgruntled, or somehow detached. But here's our challenge. Yes, we live in a post-God culture. But here's our challenge. 
How are we being a blessing to our culture? How are we seeking to the, provide the welfare in our communities? How are we being a blessing to our neighbors in the neighborhood? How are we seeking to provide goodwill towards them? That's what he's telling them to do. Live your life and be a blessing. Seek to bless them. Notice as he goes on in verse 8, he says this. He says, and for thus the, says the Lord of the host, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners, who don't let them deceive you, don't give you anything, but you're to be a blessing. Settle in and do it. Because I didn't, I didn't send you there for just two years. I sent you there for the long term. So seek to bless. We are called to move beyond just not causing trouble or conflict but to be in an active blessing to our culture, no matter how difficult it may be. Keep in mind, they had very little status. But I will remind you of Daniel when he stood up and said, I will not eat this food. But he did it in a way, he says, look, just, let's just try a trial, just a short period of time, and see what God does. And Daniel and his friends, they ate, and they realized that it was to their benefit and the hand of the Lord was on Daniel. And the people around saw, wait a minute, this is somebody that's of good character and somebody we need to really recognize. Seek to be a blessing to those around you. Verse 10 in particular, where he reveals the 70 years, we're told not only to be productive, to be a blessing, but to be patient. Here's what we have to understand. Here's where we struggle. God never promises us a quick fix, but He does promise He will do what promotes His glory and our good. He never promises a quick fix. So we just hang on to Him and we're patient. That's what He says in verse 10. When 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you. That's when it's going to happen. 70 years. So be patient. But then verses 11 through 14, we begin to see where he's going to go in the next few chapters where he tells us to be hopeful. The difficulties and hardship of our current circumstances are not permanent or definitive. God has promised an unbelievable future for those who will wait on Him. That's what he's saying in these verses, verses 11 through 14, where he says this. He says, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you. Now, as we apply this passage of Scripture, keep in mind, it's in the context. You're going to have to wait 70 years. But keep in mind, during those 70 years, while you wait, keep in mind, be hopeful, I have a plan. Okay? Okay? Sometimes we read that verse and we think that God's going to do something right away. We quote it and say, he's going to make it. Man, it's going to be great. Yeah, 70 years. Stay hopeful. Be patient. Seek the benefit of the community and the culture around you. All the while being productive. That's God's plan when life seems very confusing. This is what Jeremiah told them specifically. Here's how you are to live as captives in a foreign land where life doesn't make sense. Here's what I want to say to you and I want you to think about. We may feel like captives in our circumstances, but we are not victims. We're not to be victims. God wants us to rise above the circumstances and make a difference for Him while we await His glorious purposes to be fulfilled. We wait for Him to accomplish what He says He's going to do. That's what this is all about. That's what He's trying to tell them. He doesn't want them to get discouraged in the midst of the... Keep in mind, God says, I'm going to visit you. I'm going to give you all these great and magnificent things. I, I know the plans. Don't give up. Keep on being productive. Be a blessing to those around you and to the culture in which you've been brought into. Do not forget to be patient, waiting 
Because you have hope. That's what God's saying to them. That's the message in this passage of Scripture. And this begins the section where Jeremiah is now going to spell out many of these blessings, these plans that he has. He's going to expand on them. But as we look at this passage, I don't want us to miss the fact that the reality check is, is God saying, you're going to have to wait a long, long time. But don't give up on me, and I won't give up on you. When life doesn't go as planned, and we begin to want to falter in our faith and our hope, the message of Jeremiah 29 is, hang on, because God has a plan. And that plan doesn't necessarily mean He's going to fix it right away. Sometimes He does. Sometimes it's a week. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it's 70 years. But it doesn't change because God is faithful. He can be trusted. God knows what He's doing and we don't understand it. We can't even begin to imagine it. Why would God do this? How in the world? Here's what He says to you. I know it's confusing. I know it doesn't make sense. Be productive. Be a blessing. Be patient. And be hopeful. I'm God. I've got this. I've got it under control. Trust me. Let's pray together. Lord, these are hard words for us to come comprehend at times. You know that in this audience before me, there are many who are in circumstances that don't make sense. They can't make sense of it. They don't understand why you've done what you've done or why you're allowing what you're allowing. But they know that you're God and they're still struggling with waiting and being patient. My prayer this morning is that we will not allow ourselves to become victims of our circumstances, but we will rise above them. We will seek to be productive, be a blessing, be patient and hopeful in the midst of it all while we await you to accomplish your purposes. God, help us. May we move away from withdrawing from our culture because we don't like it or we don't understand it, but seeking to be a blessing to it and being productive in our lives. Help us to do that. There's not much that makes sense in our world. But one thing does make sense. You are on your throne and you will accomplish your purposes, regardless of whether we can figure out how you're going to do it or not. Just be with us, Lord. Patient with us in seeking to know and understand all that you desire for us. God, we come to a time where we are going to celebrate the greatest gift that you've given us, which gives us a promise of the future. Help us to celebrate in hope of what you're going to do. And we'll be sure to give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. practice of remembering what Jesus has done for us in his sacrifice on the cross and his victory over death and our sin. But we also remember it's part of the covenant, part of the promise that God indeed does have a plan, that, that this was all done so that we could be made right with God so we could have a relationship with Him. And we get to experience that here and now on earth, but we'll also get to experience an eternity where there's no more pain. 
There's no more suffering. And so our lifetime may feel like these 70 years, but we remember in this process of communion what God has done and what God is going to do. And so hopefully this morning as we participate in remembering who our God is and what He has done, this is a great encouragement to you. And so let's just take a moment and pray before we pass out the elements. Father God, we thank You for Your love for us this morning. Thank You that Your plan's not done. Lord, that the trials and struggles that we face in this life can be (laughs) encouraged and lifted up to You, Lord, knowing that You're going to take care of everything. Lord, that even as we suffer through this life, there's an end point. And Lord, that You indeed have prepared a place where there's going to be great prosperity in heaven and on a new earth. And so Jesus, we remember this morning. We remember what You've done, but we also remember Your promise. We remember the covenant that You made, Lord, that You are faithful. Great is Your faithfulness, Lord, amidst everything that we go through. Help us to remember that now as we participate in communion. We pray this in Your name. Amen.